On December 11, 2006, an unthinkable tragedy shook a multi-family villa in a small town called Erba, just outside of Como. Police and firefighters descended on the gruesome scene after receiving multiple calls. Some called because they heard blood-curdling screams, some because they saw smoke, and some saw part of the villa on fire. When the first responders arrived, they found a massacre, with some alive and most dead. The fire was growing and dangerous, so any body they could get to alive or dead, they pulled to safety, and then they would deal with putting out the fire. When all was said and done, there were four people dead, one person still alive by a miracle, and one dog who didn't manage to escape the fire and died from smoke inhalation. The fire and smoke, however, weren't what killed the people. Each of the four dead and the one just barely alive had suffered violent attacks. They had been stabbed and beaten. The police had to put the puzzle pieces together to figure out what had happened. The victims didn't have much in common, except they happened to live in the same building. This led to more questions. Were all five intended targets? And if not, who was intended and who was collateral damage? And the obvious question, who did this? One victim was only two years old, which leads us to the final question, why would anyone do this? This is the story known as the Strage di Erba. This is the story of the massacre in Como. Hello and welcome to Italian True Crime. Raffaele Castagna was born in 1976 to a well-respected and fairly prominent local family in the small town of Erba. Erba is a town of 16,000, located just a few kilometers from the larger Como, near the Lago di Como, north of Milano. Milan is only about 25 miles away, and this area has historically been a refuge for the Milanese, nowadays mostly to escape the city with its traffic and smog. This is a land of industry and business, where people admire hard work and sacrifices. But it's also full of beautiful castles, cathedrals, and churches, and looks like an amazing place to visit. Raffaella had lived her whole life in Erba and grew up well off thanks to her family's successful business. She herself chose not to be involved in the business. She left that to her two brothers. Instead, she worked part-time within a community that assisted differently abled people. She lived in an apartment that her family owned, and this was inside a large villa. However, villa isn't really the right word to describe this building. Of this type of building, there are many in Italy. It's not really an apartment building or condominium, which conjures up an image of a high-rise or semi-modern building. This is an older construction, but newly renovated, just two floors and an attic. This particular building was painted yellow, a bright and happy shade to hopefully put residents in a good mood and remind them of the sun, which Italy is famous for. There were also green shutters, just to be different and maybe add some color. There were 20 families living in this one building, so it was quite big. Raffaella lived on the first floor, which in some countries would be the second floor, but in Italy the first floor is called piano terra, or ground floor, and the next floor is therefore the first floor. Initially she lived here alone, but that wouldn't be forever, just until she fell in love, just until she met the man of her dreams, and started having kids and building a family. And that process she started in October of 2002. She was 26 years old and shopping one day at the local open-air market in Erba. She took one look at Azuz Marzouk, and it was, as the Italians say, a colpo di fulmine. She was struck by lightning. Azuz was 22 at the time and decidedly a good-looking young man. He had just arrived in Italy from Tunisia, where he grew up in a small rural town outside of Mamet, a place popular among Italians in winter looking to escape the cold. He was from a humble but respectable family. His father was a photographer, and they had land in Tunisia. Azuz himself had a way about him. He could talk to anybody, and he presented himself well. That October day, Raffaella struck up a conversation and invited Azuz to her apartment for a coffee. Within just a month, she was introducing him to her family. A few months later, they were married, and in 2004, their son Youssef was born, who Raffaella called Yuzi. At first, the Castagna family liked Azuz. Sure, they were a bit apprehensive at how quick everything had happened, from meeting to marriage to family. And maybe they even thought about the challenges of the cultural differences they would surely face. But they liked Azuz and could see that Raffaella was happy. 
Their happiness for their daughter was short-lived, however. At some point, the police came knocking and let Rafaela's family know that her boyfriend was a well-known drug dealer in the area and that they shouldn't let her marry him. And they did try to keep her away. One of her brothers took her on a long trip far away. They traveled all the way to Martinique. He chose Martinique for the distance, but also because Italians didn't need a passport. They could go with their state-issued identity card only. While they were there, Raffaella pretended to have forgotten Azuz completely, but in reality, she was stealing her brother's cell phone each night to call her big love, racking up a phone bill of about 5,000 euros. Youssef was born in 2004, and his father didn't get to stay with him too long before he was arrested and shipped off to prison for drug dealing until he received a pardon in 2006 and was released. This relationship was far from a blissful one. Actually, it seems to have been the opposite. Neighbors reported yelling from the apartment, fights between husband and wife, and a constantly crying baby. It sounded like chaos. Luckily, these old buildings have thick walls, but maybe that just wasn't enough. Everyone knew about the fights and added to it the crying baby, up at any hour. Each neighbor dealt with the situation in their own way. Some were sympathetic, some were concerned for the well-being of the family, and some were angry because they wanted peace and quiet. And at 25, via Armando Diaz, there was no peace and quiet to be found. On the evening of December 11, 2006, Rafaela was home with her mother, 60-year-old Paula Gali, and her son Yosef. Paula had come to help out as Azuz was not home, and she was happy to spend time with her beautiful little grandson. It was nearing 8 p.m., and the TV was on in almost every apartment at Via Armando Diaz 25. The TVs weren't loud enough, however, to drown out the sounds of screaming. While the neighbors were used to the yelling, this was a different sound. This was the sound that you were lucky to live your whole life never hearing. The neighbors described it as blood-curdling, the scream you can't ignore, especially when it's coming from your neighbor, from someone you know and see every day, and someone you've known for years. The screams were soon followed by smoke. By 8.20 p.m., the apartment was full of smoke and flames. Just upstairs from Raffaella lived an older couple, Valeria Cherubini, 55 years old, and her husband, Mario Frigerio. They both came running down to help, or maybe just running down, as the smoke and flames would have started entering their apartment and they had to get out of there. Valeria and Mario ran towards the apartment of Raffaella, but their timing couldn't have been worse. Whatever evil thing had caused the blood-curdling screams was still there and wasn't interested in witnesses or survivors. In the meantime, two nearby neighbors, one of whom was also a volunteer firefighter, came running to see if they could help. As they ran up the stairs to the first floor apartment, they first found Mario Frigerio lying down with his head inside the apartment and his body outside. They dragged Mario by his ankles to the farthest point from the fire. Mario was miraculously still alive and all due basically to a birth defect. He was saved by congenital malformation of the carotid artery, which prevented him from bleeding to death. The murderers would have absolutely been sure he was dead considering the damage they had done to him, but they didn't know about this rare abnormality. The door of the apartment was open, so the rescuers entered and immediately discovered the lifeless and burning body of Rafaela Castagna. The first responders carried Rafaela to the landing while attempting to extinguish the flames that encircled it. From upstairs, they could hear a female voice calling for help. Mario made gestures to the rescuers that there was someone upstairs. With his serious neck injuries, he wasn't able to speak. But these two volunteers didn't have any resources with them to enter either Raphael's apartment nor the one upstairs, as by now the smoke was getting thicker. It was heartbreaking because they knew little Yusef must be in there, and they knew there was a woman upstairs they just couldn't reach. The Erba firefighters arrived soon after and extinguished the fire. When they were able to enter the burned apartments, they counted four lifeless bodies. The one survivor, Mario, was seriously injured and urgently transported to the Santana Hospital in Como, where he underwent various interventions and woke up from anesthesia two full days later. The first victim identified was the owner of the apartment, Rafaela Castagna. She had been attacked and hit repeatedly with a metal bar and died from the resulting head injuries. She was also stabbed 12 times and then had her throat cut. Her mother, Paola Gali, who had been staying to help out, was also killed, stabbed, and hit with an object. Her body was found in the hallway outside her grandson's bedroom. Like her daughter, the cause of death was from head injuries. The third victim was Rafaela's son, Yusef, who received only one single cut to the throat that severed the carotid artery. 
he bled to death on the sofa. And the final victim was the woman who had been yelling for help, alive up until the very end. She was Valeria Cherubini, the wife of Mario. She was found in their attic apartment. Valeria, like her surviving husband, had been attacked with a knife, suffering dozens of stab wounds, as well as attacked with a blunt object. She was still alive and had managed with difficulty to drag herself upstairs back to her apartment, but there she died of suffocation from the carbon monoxide. Valeria and Mario's dog was also in the apartment, and he was discovered, also killed by carbon monoxide, his autopsy performed by the very same coroner as the others. Further reconstructions determine that there must have been two attackers, one of them left-handed, and they were armed with two short and long-bladed knives as well as a crowbar. This bloody massacre in Prosperous Como sparked nationwide media attention, and for the first 24 hours, there was only one possible perpetrator. In fact, the people of Italy had solved the case and didn't need the police to go any further. It was obviously Azuz Marzouk, the Tunisian husband. He was a convicted drug dealer, and witnesses had reported of their epic fights. His reputation in just 24 hours suffered such a big hit it would take years to recover. But he was in Tunisia visiting his family at the time of the murders, and upon hearing of the death of his wife and two-year-old son, he rushed back to Italy to help the Carabinieri. The Carabinieri interrogated him, but soon determined he was not involved. The Carabinieri were also interviewing all of the neighbors. Most neighbors they found were nervous and anxious, worried that the murderers were still out there and maybe they would strike again and go after survivors. In fact, all neighbors were acting as police would have expected, all but two. A couple that lived downstairs, Olindo Romano and Rosa Bazzi. Olindo and Rosa were disinterested in the events. They were keeping to themselves and seemed downright annoyed about the continued police presence around their courtyard. Not only strange behavior, but it soon came to light the problems between Rosa and Olindo and Rafaela and Azuz. Not only had the neighbors reported on their battles, but Rosa had filed complaints against Rafaela and vice versa. There was no love lost between these two. They hated each other, and everyone knew it. It had been noted that the first night when investigators made their initial rounds, both had some small type of injury. Rosa had a fresh and bleeding cut on her finger, and Olindo had bruises on his hand and forearm. Also, when investigators first began asking usual and general questions to the different residents of the building, Rosa and Olindo immediately showed them a receipt from McDonald's from that evening. This was exactly the type of thing that raised suspicions among police, having evidence of your alibi too handy and too prepared, even before it's been asked for. These were enough suspicions for police to obtain a warrant to search their home and vehicle. Inside the vehicle, they found traces of Valeria's blood, and the police had enough to arrest them on January 8, 2007. Italians were blown away by this arrest. Here was an unassuming, hard-working, middle-aged couple. Neither seemed to have done too much in their lifetime other than cook, clean, and work. And now they were accused of having planned and committed one of the worst atrocities in modern Italy, and even brutally murdered a two-year-old? Who were Rosa and Olindo? Rosa Bazzi was born in Erba on September 12, 1963. At the time of the murders and fire, she was 43 years old. Her parents were also from Erba. Her father was a laborer at a nearby cement factory, and her mother was a housewife. Rosa was the youngest of three girls and was described as the most annoying of the three. Her studies ended at fifth grade, and from then on she dedicated her spare time to cooking and cleaning and watching television. She was mostly alone and from reports didn't have many friends nor any boyfriends. In interviews with Rosa's mother after the arrest, the mother mentioned several times a potential sexual assault when Rosa was only 10 or 11 from a family member, probably an uncle. But the mother was always vague about it and passed over it as if it wasn't really important or relevant. Hearing her mother and father's interviews, it's clear that there's a big problem. They have nothing nice to say about their daughter. At one point, the mother said, Rosa è venuta su storta, cattiva come l'aglio, anzi peggio, piena di veleno. What she said was, Rosa grew up crooked, mean as garlic. Even worse, she was full of poison. Rosa and her mother haven't spoken in years, and you can see why. Her father, in an interview, said Rosa was mean and she didn't love anybody. He explained that when he was sick in the hospital, she only came once, stood in the doorway, and said, Everything okay? And then left. 
But now back to Rosa herself and how she met Olindo. Six years after finishing primary school, Rosa became interested in the idea of enrolling in an evening nursing school, and she began to support herself financially through cleaning jobs. And here is where she met Olindo. Olindo was born on February 10, 1962, further up in the Alps from Erba in the province of Sondrio, found right below San Moritz, but still in Italy. His mother was originally from Sondrio, but his father was from Puglia. He was the eldest of four siblings, but by the time of the arrest, he had cut ties with his entire family, not unlike Rosa, and there had been a lawsuit filed against him by his father and brother over a family dispute. So when these two found each other, they almost immediately fell into a morbid attachment. They didn't seem to like other people very much. And it's funny then that they would build their home in a place with so many neighbors. But on their meager earnings, this was really a nice building and area, and they threw themselves into making it their peaceful haven. They lived by strict rules. TV news at 1, lunch at 1.15, dinner at 7.30, in bed by 10. The curtains were always drawn so the sun didn't fade the couch. And Rosa did all the cooking, the cleaning, and she kept Olindo's clothes perfectly cleaned and everything ironed and neatly folded. Olindo's role in the house was to empty the garbage and empty the dishwasher, besides, of course, his job outside the home. They were both fastidious about their rules and about tidiness, and they didn't like chaos. Well, chaos is exactly what they found over at Raffaella's apartment. Too bad they just weren't further apart then maybe this would have all been very different for everybody. But fate brought them together. In a Hollywood movie, this would have had a happy ending. Raphael and her family would have taught Rosa and Olindo to loosen up a little and learn to love life for all of its inconsistencies and imperfections. And Rosa and Olindo would have helped Raffaella grow her son and give him stability and rules. But in real life, these neighborly conflicts only grow. They start with a few arguments from the balcony and often end up as obsessions between the tenants, spending free time thinking up some disrespect to do to the other. In the case of Rose and Raffaella, reciprocal complaints have been going on since 2001, though no one is sure when it all began. It had definitely started much earlier. Some of the complaints were insults, kicking, spitting, and punching. Rosa claims Azuz spit on her in a dark hallway in one of her official complaints, and in another she says she was attacked by Raffaella, who reproached her for the sound of the carpet cleaner or her clothes hanging out to dry. She claims Raffaella threw drier water on her. This was all, of course, denied by Raffaella and Azuz, who claimed that they were the victims. On New Year's Eve 2005, Raffaella declared that both Olindo and Rosa attacked her and threw her to the ground, causing several injuries. She made a formal complaint, but she had offered to drop the charges for 5,000 euros in compensation for moral and material damage. The hearing on this complaint had been planned for exactly two days after the murders. Following the arrest of Rosa and Olindo, they were interrogated for two days, and then they both cracked. They confessed to the crime, explaining to police exactly how they killed the victims. According to their confession, Olindo was the mastermind, but Rosa was his accomplice, and together they brutally murdered four people, severely injured a fifth, and cut the throat indifferently of a two-year-old child. They knew things in the confession that police hadn't made public. Between the confessions, the blood in the car, the fact that Rosa was left-handed and they had already determined one of the perpetrators was left-handed, this was an open and shut case. But there had been a witness, if you remember, Mario Frigerio. As soon as the police were able to interrogate him, they were asking him to remember everything he could about the killers. He told police he remembered a dark-skinned man, olive complexion, someone he had never seen before, and someone who wasn't from the area. Now, if you've seen a picture of Olindo, this did not fit him at all. And Mario actually knew Olindo, so if it was even close to Olindo, he would have just said the name of his neighbor. But police continued to question him, and eventually his eyewitness testimony, the only one, was saying, yes, it was Olindo, as a matter of fact. So now the final missing piece, the prosecution had everything they needed. Azuz was back from Tunisia and asking for the death penalty against Rosa and Olindo. The first hearing was held on January 29, 2008. During the hearings, Rosa and Olindo passed the time whispering and giggling with each other even when the courtroom was shown photographs of little Yousef's body. They were doing absolutely nothing to endear themselves to the public or the judges. On February 18, 2008, 
Olindo accused the carabinieri who interrogated him of having brainwashed him and convincing him to confess. He said they promised him only a few years in prison and the immediate release of his wife, Rosa. In the meantime, their neighbors testified before the court that Rosa and Olindo had created a climate of terror in the condominium with furious arguments and verbal threats. Neighbors said the couple even threw vases into other people's terraces and at different times sent threatening letters from lawyers. Over the years, the police were called in to intervene and several tenants of the building had preferred to move elsewhere to avoid further problems. One neighbor testified that shortly before the massacre, Olindo had given her a mass of handwritten pages containing their version of the quarrels with Rafaela and her family, asking to type them up for him. On February 28, 2008, Olindo released a second spontaneous declaration, insisting on the alleged brainwashing by police and declaring that he was treated like a beast in the Como prison. The testimonies of the carabinieri who question him, and confirmed by listening to the recordings made, reveal instead that Olindo and Rosa confessed, telling them that they wanted to free their conscience. Rosa spoke at the trial in the subsequent hearing on March 3, 2008. In her deposition, she declared that she confessed due to the promise of house arrest. Furthermore, she affirmed that she never went up to Rafaela's apartment, and she denied having ever had arguments with her, claiming on the contrary that she had tried to help her when she was in need. On November 26, 2008, the Court of Assises pronounced the sentence. The Romano couple were sentenced to life imprisonment with daytime isolation for three years. The court also established as compensation 500,000 euros for the Frigerios, 60,000 euros for Azuz, 20,000 for his parents residing in Tunisia. On May 3, 2011, the Supreme Court of Cassation rejected the proposed appeals, confirming the sentence of life imprisonment. Rosa and Olindo are serving their sentences in different prisons but are allowed to meet once per month. The defense team of Rosa and Olindo have never stopped making appeals and proclaiming the innocence of the couple. They question the eyewitness that he was not credible, and if anything, the first testimony should be used, that of a stranger to the building, someone unknown and with dark skin. They say that Rafaela was a target due to her husband's drug dealing. There could easily be people that would hurt their family, maybe thinking Azuz was home too, but killing any witnesses that came around. They also question the blood found. The police had searched every inch of the home and car and only found one drop of blood. It is true they were clean freaks, and Rosa was probably a very talented cleaner. But could she have really cleaned up that well right after the murder? The defense team argues that the blood in the car could easily have been due to contamination that occurred during the investigation. In fact, they use this evidence as confirmation that it would be unlikely Rosa and Olinda were involved as where were all the traces of blood on their clothes, shoes, and in their home? And the most damning of all, the confessions. The defense argued that their clients weren't that bright and were susceptible to suggestion. The police were intimidating them and trying to coerce confessions and that they fed them the information that was unknown to the public, showing them crime scene photos and trying to persuade them to acknowledge their guilt. These arguments have been good enough to win over a good share of the public. Even more interesting, as of April 2011, Azuz Marzouk changed his mind about Rosa and Olindo. He told the world he thought they were innocent of the murder of his family. He asked that the case be reopened. Not only did he proclaim their innocence, but he also had an idea of who the real killer was. He wanted police to investigate the brothers of Rafaela, Giuseppe and Pietro Castagna. There had been issues in the family about inheritance, and Rafaela had been asking her father to anticipate her shares in the family business so she and Azuz could move to Tunisia and start a business there. The brothers deny this possibility. They say, anyway, the family agreement is that she was not involved in the business and had no shares anyway, that all was settled within the family. They sued Azuz, who was ordered to pay them 70,000 euros for defamation. In April 2023, the Deputy Attorney General of Milan presented a new request for review of the trial, arguing that the testimony of the witness Mario Frigerio was not reliable, that the traces of DNA could be due to contamination, and that the confessions of the couple contained too many errors to be credible. Seventeen years later, we will now be hearing again on the news about Rosa and Olindo, about Raffaella and Piccolo Youssef.
about the poor couple upstairs and their dog, and about the grandmother, who was also in the wrong place at the wrong time. Lots of collateral damage at 25 Via Armando Diaz, the beautiful yellow villa. So next time you are about to complain to your neighbor about hanging her laundry out too early in the morning or about a crying baby at 3 a.m., remember what good that did Rosa and Olindo or the Castagna and Marzouk families. Maybe just bring your neighbor some cookies and ask if they've had trouble sleeping and is everything okay. Maybe they just need someone to talk to. Thank you for listening to Italian True Crime, the English-language true crime podcast for Italophiles. When I think of this case, I just remember those two faces, Rosa and Olindo, aired on every media station since 2006. This case is frustrating. If it is true that Rosa and Olindo are innocent, then two lives have been ruined and there are no other leads, meaning somewhere two killers have gotten away with murdering four people, with murdering a baby in cold blood. It does seem unlikely that these two are some evil criminal masterminds. These murders looked more like the work of individuals with some experience. And yet listening to the other neighbors all testify against them, maybe they really did plot and plan to murder an entire family that they hated, that they wanted to go away forever so they could finally live in peace and quiet and follow those life rules that made them feel safe and protected.